Hamilton. Welcome to the Modern Puritan Podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, you told me just outside that uh, you've never had a glass of beer in your life. That's right. Very unusual <laughs> for a Scotsman from the east end of Glasgow. Unheard of, but never liked the smell. Mm -hmm. So I've never tasted. Yeah. Well, thankfully, we have ginger beer here for you at uh, RHV. Well, let me start with the question that uh, mm. after just, you know, knowing some things about you and reading some things from you, um, that I, I hope gets to the heart of who you are, but that is this, why has God become so small in the Reformed Church? Of course, then by implication, the church as a whole. Why has he become so small? Well, I suppose there's no one reason, but I tend to think that the major reason is the church is so concerned to be relevant, which is a good thing. Uh, the gospel must be relevant to the people to whom we speak. But relevance becomes a mantra and it becomes the be all and the end all. And we lose sight of the fact that God himself is the great relevance. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. And because the church is so intent on showing itself to be engaging and relevant, um, God, as he has revealed himself in the Bible, becomes somewhat peripheral to the desire to be presented as cutting edge, um, aware of the cultural currents that are swirling around. And all of that actually is, is good, but when it becomes the obsession, and I think it has become the obsession of the church, doctrine, not just the doctrine of God, but I think supremely the doctrine of God, becomes almost peripheralized, and people lose the sight and the sense of the grandeur of God. And what Luther said to Erasmus uh, when he wrote his response to Erasmus, the bondage of the will, de servo arbitrio, he says, your problem, Erasmus, is your God is too small. Because Erasmus kept looking at uh, the world around him, uh, the church that he was a part of, and he wasn't willing to allow the godness of God to shape and determine and style how he should think, how, she, how he should live. And that's been one of the besetting sins of the church throughout its history, uh, looking over its shoulder at the world and not looking first upwards to God and being transformed by the visio dei, the vision of God, and taking that out of the felt experience of the grandeur of God and confronting with the, uh, the world around us with God as he is, not, as, not a God that is but a bigger version of ourselves, Psalm 50. You just use this term, the godness of God. And um, in other places you've talked about the, the loss of focus or even the, the ignorance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what do you think is, you, you talked about this obsession with relevance for the Christian church, and I hear that, but what is happening kind of on the ground level that is, is causing the churches to lose sight of this, this Trinitarian God? Almost as if, well, I would say even in an evangelical context, it's kind of like, you know, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. But, but, but we like, where is the disconnect that we're not, we're not showing people? When I say we, I mean those preaching, those teaching. Where is the disconnect that we're not showing people that the God whom we serve is triune and from that flows 
everything else that we know about who he is and who we are? And... Well, I think in the past 50, 60, 70 years, we have become almost crystal monistic in our understanding of the gospel. Um, we have dislocated the Lord Jesus Christ from the Holy Trinity. Uh, I remember recently writing uh, a piece saying that the fundamental foundational doctrine of the Christian religion is the Holy Trinity. And, and someone responded nicely to me in a letter and said, surely you're wrong. Surely it's justification by grace alone through faith alone. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. And I responded by saying, the Jesus we encounter in the gospel is the sent one of the Father. He has come as the obedient servant, the, the better than Adam. He comes upheld by the Spirit. It's by Hebrews 9, by the eternal Spirit, he offers himself unblemished to God. That Christian salvation is Trinitarian. But that sounds to people initially as being too complicated. We, we need to make the gospel simple, but the gospel isn't simple. The gospel is profound beyond words. I was converted through hearing someone preach John 3.16. I had no Bible background, no church background, no Christian background. And it sounded so exquisitely simple. But actually, I quickly realized how profound it was. God, who is God, so loved the world? Why, why would God love this world? He gave his only begotten son. Who is this only begotten son? I don't actually like modern translations, unique and one and only, because I don't think they actually get to the heart of monogamy's huios, um, that we should not perish. So when you unpack the gospel, you suddenly realize, my, oh my, this is profound. And the God who is, is triune. And if we dislocate the Lord Jesus Christ from his, the triunity of God, we actually are preaching another gospel. We're dislocating Christ from the whole history of redemption, the theology of redemption, that he comes as the better than Adam, um, the second man, the last Adam. And the desire for simplicity can rob the church, which I think it has done, of its profundity. So when Calvin, in book one of the Institutes, is explicating the doctrine of God, he says, these words of Gregory Nazianzen vastly delight me. Now, Calvin's a tightly buttoned up Frenchman. And whenever he says anything like vastly delights me, you stop and you think, oh my, what is that? And he's quoting three lines of Gregory, a uh, late fourth century Greek church father. Uh, actually, it's baptismal oration 40, section 41. And Gregory's preparing a young man for baptism. And it's fascinating because he begins by saying to the young man, I need to teach you about who God is. But when I think of the one who is three and of the three who is one, my mind is overwhelmed, my heart is filled, tears run down my face. I need to turn aside and worship. And Calvin says, these words vastly delight me. And I remember for the first years and years ago, reading this, thinking, when was I last overwhelmed by the wonder of who God is? And yet these early church fathers, they didn't get everything right, of course. Not at Calvin, although I think in the main he did. <laughs> He's my great Christian hero. Um, they were overwhelmed by the godness of God. And that gave salvation its richness, its profundity, um, the covenant of redemption, uh, the incarnation, uh, the life of Christ, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, they all belong to the internal coherence of the Holy Trinity. And 
that's what worship is. Worship is coming to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. Um, I don't mean we shouldn't pray to Jesus or that we can't even pray to the Holy Spirit. The early fathers had a phrase, the opera ad extra trinitatis and divisa sunt. Um, the external works of the Trinity are indivisible. The, the, the Son is always the Son of the Father. Uh, the Spirit is always the one sent from the Father and the Son, etc. Um, and that gives a luster, a profundity, that in our modern age of reductionism, we lose sight of. And we think we're doing the world and even the church a favour when we say, you know, you know, theology, well, theology is, is important, but actually it's recondite. It, it doesn't really affect how we live the Christian life and how we get salvation in Christ. As soon as you think that, you become an open door for heresy. Hmm. Which is why the early church um, was so passionate about the person of Christ, his deity, his relationship to the Father, um, the perichoresis, the internal relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. The early church and the, the reformers would be bewildered by what passes for evangelicalism today. They, they wouldn't recognize it. They would think it was, a, I, I think, a truncated Christianity um, because we have made man the center of the gospel and not the glory of God. And when you do that, ultimately you end up losing the gospel. Hmm. You're probably aware of this, but within um, certain scholarly circles, there, there has been this renewed emphasis on the Trinity and but most of these scholars are students of church the church fathers um you've got to know your latin to get into this work but also catholic theologians uh one of whom was on the faculty at durham when i was there lewis Ayers. Mm -hmm. and um my concern is that this emphasis on the trinity fails to make it to the pulpit so these, these men, and I think a few women, are having these incredible discussions and this resuscitation of robust Trinitarian theology and, and whatnot. But um, w when will we see that coming from the pulpit? And I, I would have to s confess that in my seminary um, education, I don't remember much of a focus on the Trinity per se. It was, of course, mentioned at times, but we were so busy doing other things at seminary, you know, getting ready for going out to our pulpits or whatever it is. But um, I, I would have, I wish that I would have received more of a, how would I say it? If you're familiar at all with Catholic uh, theology, so for example, uh, Mariology, a Catholic apologist will talk about Mary as, well, the more you learn about Mary, it's actually the more you learn about Christ, that kind of thing. Where if, for us who are Reformed, it's like, well, the more we know about Christ, actually what we're learning more about the Trinity. It all comes back to the Trinity. And I just feel that, like if, if you just looked at, say, the last 100 titles published by the various authors within our circle, RHB and others, Christ is going to be in the, the name somewhere in a lot of these, but not so much the Trinity or Trinitarian or, or these types of terms. So I guess my question to you is, how how do we how do we change the trajectory? How do you how do we get the Trinity back in the discussion? How do we how do we move from the the simplistic invite Jesus into your heart or believe in Christ or you know faith alone? Again, none of this is wrong, but how do we how do we get people to where you could even go out on the street and talk to someone and say? There is a God and he exists in three persons. 
And those three persons have manifested themselves in different ways. You know what I'm saying? Like a more mm-hmm. robust type of a engagement with the world that uh, goes beyond just, um, you know, have faith in this obscure Jewish man who lived thousands of, or a few thousand years ago and be saved. And like, well, I don't even know what that, any of that means. You see well, what I'm getting at? It's like, how do we, how do we get the, the Trinity into the, the vulgar language as it were? I'm almost tempted to say, we need to begin to read our Bibles properly. When I came to faith in my late teens with no background whatsoever, I was profoundly privileged to be exposed to um, gospel ministry that was rich, and in particular, the opening prayer of George Philip in Glasgow, James Philip in Edinburgh, William Still, Eric Alexander, and, and then latterly Sinclair Ferguson. The opening prayers were profound, they were rich, um, they weren't thinking, right, I need to dumb everything down, you know, lowest common denominator. They wanted to lift people up. They didn't use um, recondite language, they didn't talk about perichoresis or operated extra, but their prayers were rich in almost an unformulated awareness that God's revelation is natively Trinitarian, that the gospel is natively Trinitarian. The Trinity isn't just an, an add-on at the end uh, through the fa- through the, uh, to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, but it is the DNA of the Christian religion. Um, so you, I was learning the glory of the Holy Trinity, not just as a doctrine, but as a divine revelation that related to my salvation through these opening prayers. And there were times I can honestly say, I just thought, I need to go home now and just think about this. Mm. This is so wonderful. Thankfully, I didn't. <laughs> and uh, the services unfolded and the way they read the scriptures mm. um, and, and the preaching, it's, it's almost like an iceberg, you know, when... When you see an iceberg, you see the top of it. And that's Christ, if you like. Um, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But undergirding that, there is this glorious truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead. He's the only begotten of the Father, um, what, whatever that may mean. Um, he's sent from the Father. He's upheld by the Spirit. He he can do nothing of himself because in his creatureliness he has come to be the better than Adam. Um, and I, I just think we need to recover again the organic uh, relatedness of the Bible. But then in seminaries, I mean, I, I'd have to be honest, that if, if we, for example, were appointing a professor of Hebrew amongst the questions, and I'm not Hebraist, I would be asking him, um, tell me about your relationship to the Holy Trinity. Hmm. Tell me how Hebrew grammar and how you'll teach it will help your students better understand God's self-revelation of himself as Holy Trinity. Um, And I would do that whether it was hermeneutics, um, apologetics, um, New Testament, whatever. Because you can't, I don't think, teach these subjects distinct from or discreetly from the God who is. It's all about God. It's all about God. Um, I hope this isn't irrelevant, as you, as you can cut it out. A few years ago, um, a, a dear friend, a very fine Reformed Baptist, um, came up to me. We know each other very well. And he, he sat down and he said, Ian, give me your best argument for baptizing babies. <laughs> and I smiled and I said, the immutability of God. Now, he, he said, oh, right. Now, he, he, we, we talked and we agreed to differ. 
that's fine. You know, we, <laughs> we were able to talk. But what I wanted to go over was um, my convictions regarding that are not based on a text here, a text there, a text there, mm. discreetly. Mm -hmm. They are rooted and grounded in the being of God. Mm. And the older I get, and I was saying this last Sunday night in the church where my wife and I worship, where I preach regularly. Maybe it's my age. I hope it's not just my age. I increasingly think everything comes down to your doctrine of God. Whatever subject you're talking about, whatever area of the Christian life, what you think of God is going to shape and style everything else. Martin Busser, who so influenced Calvin, um, in his commentary on Romans, if I remember rightly, says, true theology is not theoretical, it is practical. The end of it is to live a godly life. Vera theologia, non theoretica practica es, finis equidum de formem. The end of it is to live a godly life. But you can't live a godly life if you don't know what godly means. Mm -hmm. And so the believer's relationship, union with Christ, is union with the triune God mm -hmm. in Christ. And understanding that or at least beginning to begin to understand that, will spill over from professor to student, from pastor to congregation. Congregations not only hear a pastor's words, they can feel and even smell his words. You know, Paul talks about being an aroma of Christ to God. I think congregations need to feel the weight of the pastor's words who has come in some small, small way to not only be captured by the truth that God is triune, but captivated by the wonder and glory that he's triune. But doesn't that mean that preaching itself needs to change. Meaning if what you're observing, and we should probably trust some of what you're seeing out there uh, over a long career as in ministry and as a scholar, is what, um, and as an author, is um, doesn't, doesn't the preaching in the church need to change? I mean, not for everyone. I, I, I think there are some men out there who are perhaps fulfilling this vision that you're casting in a way of men that they, they just bleed this, this, uh, this Trinitarian uh, essence from the pulpit in their, in their counseling, where whatever, uh, whatever role that they're fulfilling in their title as pastor or preacher. But, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a story. So we, we were visiting churches when we first moved back here from England a year ago. And we had gone to this one place for a few Sundays and one of the elders and I had just gotten to chatting. And I don't remember what led to this part of the conversation, but I said something to the effect of, yeah, I feel like in the churches we've become so focused on Christ that we've neglected the rest of the Trinity. And he looked at me like I had said something hmm. <laughs> that you probably shouldn't say in church. Like he just had this, it was like anything against a uh, complete Christocentrism was not to be accepted. And that wasn't what I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to downplay Christ at all. It was actually, actually no, let's, you actually elevate Christ when you elevate the Trinity. And... But I remember it, to the day I die, I'll probably remember his interaction because he didn't understand. And then I thought, poor man, but it's not his fault. He isn't getting taught because I just hearing the sermons that I had there for the past few weeks, I realized 
um, and this isn't just that church, which I would never name, but it's just so common to have very, whether it's topical or so-called exegetical, that's just packed full of anecdotes from everyday life. We're not hearing a lot of theology proper from the pulpit. And even if in good exegesis, oftentimes, perhaps, at least from my experience, I hear men who get too kind of lost in the weeds mm -hmm. and forget to talk about that, that greater, larger, bigger reality. And <laughs> it was in an interview that I heard of you where you said, um, well, I guess I'll just pose the question to you is what, what, it, what do you most regret having not said from the pulpit all those years in Cambridge? And um, where were you before that? I forget. In New Mills in Ayrshire, yeah. Southwest Scotland. Okay. What, if you could do it again, if you could go back to those churches as a young man, but with the knowledge you have now, what would you do differently to make God bigger? Well, that's a, a question that puts me very much on the spot. I've sometimes thought about that and looked back and sometimes metaphorically, sometimes physically just sh shaken my head at myself. I would say this, I wouldn't change anything that I've said, but I would have preached it less proudly hmm. and more prayerfully. Hmm. I think I was too concerned at times that people rightly understood the truth. I, I was ministering in the Church of Scotland and truth was at a discount. And of course, that's a vital thing. You know, I, I know you won't misunderstand me. But there's a texture to truth, you know, uh, speaking the truth in love. Um, you, can, you, you can preach and say all the right things, but it's a bit like painting by numbers. Hmm. You know, you, you get everything in its place, but you kind of wonder where the life is. And I think at times I was overly concerned that the head was being rightly taught. And I at times forgot, probably, maybe that's not the right word, but I forgot that you can teach the head, but if you neglect the heart, and my own lack of deep fellowship with the Lord um, manifested itself, I think, in my preaching. It was accurate. It was reformed. It was in measure experiential, I believe. It was deeply evangelical, I believe. Um, but... It lacked it lacked the profundity that I first encountered as a young Christian in the ministry of men like George and Jim Philip and William Still and Eric Alexander, because they understood that when you preach the word, it's the overflow of your life. And at times I was too content with people getting uh, a right understanding of what the gospel actually is. And almost being content with that so that they could verbally confess the truth but not be captivated by it. You know, I think when I was a young Christian, I, I quickly became a Calvinist. I didn't know these terms. 
I was captured by the truth, but it took longer for the truth to captivate me. And then I realized over a period of time, Jesus Christ is the truth. God is the truth. It's not truth dislocated from who God is. It's the God who is truth that's to captivate you. Um, and that's why I, I, I've striven poorly, perhaps often, to be a Catholic Christian in the best sense of the word, to see beyond my own tradition to men and women who love the Lord, who love him because of who he is and what he's done. They may not have the same, quite the same theology as me. They, they may not have the privileged education that I've had. But and I'm thinking of one wonderful godly church planter from Scotland who's been almost 50 years in France. He wouldn't understand half of the language that I might use. But every time I think of him, I think of the Lord. Mm. Um, that's a rambling response, mm -hmm. but um, I think people greatly need to hear from pulpits truth that has been sifted through a deep, prayerful, um, loving communion with God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I think, put it simply and beautifully. He said, I can forgive a preacher anything if he'll give me big thoughts of God. Hmm. And that's what people need. They need to be overwhelmed. You know, Psalm 50, verse 17, the Lord says to his people, you thought I was just like you, a bigger version of you, but I'm nothing like you. And people need to realize, pastors need to realize, you can preach on the immensity of God, the simplicity of God, the infinity of God, and do it pastorally. Mm. Because truth is pastoral. All truth is pastoral. Um, and that's why I love those words of Martin Busser, that true theology is not theoretical. It's practical. The end of it is to live a godly life. And if our preaching and theology and sound is not leading to godly living and we've got our theology all wrong do you think there's another um descriptor to add to Busser? so there's theoretical practical but also mysterious like have we lost the mystery mm -hmm. in our attempts to be clinical and ex precise and if I'm often asked, you know, what, what, what's your favorite passage in the Bible? Well, <laughs> depends what day of the week it is. <laughs> but almost always I'll say, well, probably the closing words of Romans 11. Paul's been expounding mm. the gospel profoundly, deeply, um, logically, coherently. Um, and then he comes and he just says, you know, oh, the depths. Mm -hmm. Theology, if it doesn't lead to doxology, isn't theology. And simply having right thoughts isn't enough. You know, the Pharisees believed in verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. But they were a diameter removed from the God of the Bible. And when Paul says, oh, the depths... How unsearchable. He, he's talking about a reverent agnosticism almost. He's saying, I'm out of my depth. He said, I, I, I've, I've, I've taken you and I've taken myself so far by the grace of God. But here, brothers and sisters, here we need to say we're out of our depth. Mm -hmm. And I think preaching should leave people with that sense of, of wonder. You know, we, we sing lost in wonder, love and praise. And whenever I sing that hymn, I almost want to stop and say to myself, can you honestly sing that? Mm. We sing amazing grace. How amazing is grace? Um, you know, we can rightly point the finger at um, great 
or significant people throughout church history and say, well, you know, they didn't get this right or that right. But when you read some Bernard of Clairvaux, whom Calvin really liked, he didn't, you know, he didn't agree with everything Bernard wrote. But he quotes Bernard many times. Um, it's this lost in wonder, love and praise that gripped Bernard, who had big failings, not least his support of the Second Crusade. Or was it the Third Crusade? One of them. Um, the godness of God would do more than anything else to recover the church from its from its deadness, from its preoccupation with modernity. You know, I often think of C.S. Lewis's words, fads and fashions come and go, but they mainly go. <laughs> and that isn't, you know, saying we, we, we need to preach as if we lived in the 17th century. I don't believe that at all. But um, what people need more than anything else, what's, what would be the most user-friendly ministry for the Christian church today would be to recover the godness of God mm. in its worship. That's the big issue, I think, facing the church today. Mm. I remember during my doctoral work at Durham, I was, um, I was working in, in Romans and um, um, reading quite a bit of Luther and came across his, uh, the hidden God, his concept of the hidden God. And it, it, I think it distracted me for about a few weeks because I wanted to know more about, it just resonated so much with me because I had come from a background of, or I do come from a background of, well, I grew up at John MacArthur's church mm -hmm. and still love John to this day. And John is so precise and yeah. so exacting about the text and about the theology. And that was my background. And so when I, as, as high of regard as I hold John MacArthur in, well, Luther here, <laughs> uh, Luther, I, I would have to say I hold in higher regard for certain reasons, but um, to hear Luther talk about God in the sense of being hidden, like not able to be completely understood. Mm. And so anyway, that's where that question comes from. Yeah, L Luther uses the phrase Deus absconditus, mm. um, God's absconded. And if, if I remember rightly, he, he, he takes it from Isaiah 45, verse 15. Truly you are a God who hides himself. Yes. Isaiah is bewildered with God. He's absolutely dumbfounded that God's going to raise up the pagan Babylonians to smash, really, his own covenant people. And... It's, it's the same thing in, in Habakkuk chapter 1. You know, we, we, we use those words, um, God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, but we isolate it from the context. What's, what Habakkuk is saying is, you're of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, but you're raising up the Babylonians. I, mm. don't, I don't understand this. Mm. And the transcendence of God, the infinitely otherness of God um, are truths that we're uncomfortable with, I think, because we have often reduced the God of the Bible to a set of propositions. Now, we believe in propositional revelation, but propositions don't save us. Mm. It's Jesus Christ sent by the Father, upheld by the Spirit, who makes atonement, who saves us. Now, you can't separate the propositions from the person, of course not. But um, you're not saved by believing in justification, by grace alone through faith alone. And I think sometimes we... we I think I heard Sinclair Ferguson say this many years ago. We, um, we're not actually saved by faith. We're saved by Jesus Christ, whom we receive by faith. Mm. And I, I, I think too often we preach on justification 
instead of preaching Jesus Christ or justifying righteousness. Hmm. Um, a year or two ago, one of my dear friends sent me a, a sermon of his assistant, nice, good fellow. He wondered what I thought of the sermon. It was, it was on repentance. And there was a lot of good, good things in the sermon. I remember replying and saying, well, I, I don't think we should preach repentance. And my friend knew what I was saying. He wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't saying you don't preach repentance. We preach repentance towards God and, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, faith always takes, whether or not always grammatically, but certainly always theologically, the direct object. And we talk about the benefits of Christ, and we know that we can't separate the person of Christ from the benefits of Christ, but often we preach as if we do. And we're holding out salvation instead of Jesus Christ, the Saviour. And that might seem plain with words, but I actually don't think it is. Um, one of my favourite verses, I may be rambling on here, one of my favourite verses in the Bible is in Luke chapter 2, where Mary and Joseph bring the infant Jesus into the temple. And uh, Simeon takes up this little bundle of fragile humanity and said, Lord, let now thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He looks on this, this helpless bundle of humanity and he sees the salvation of God. And it's Jesus Christ we preach and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. I'm always struck, 2 Corinthians <laughs> 4 verse 5, uh, we preach not ourselves, which the Corinthians, these false apostles were doing, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and, so he has this copulative, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And I think what Paul is saying is, we are preachers whom God has raised up to serve his people. And Calvin in that passage, if I remember, says, the highest honour to which a pastor can aspire is to serve God's people. And how do you serve them? You preach Jesus Christ as Lord. So, hmm. You've written a lot of books. And well, I've written a few. No. <laughs> Some relatively. are okay. Some are okay. Well, that, well that's, a, that's a good admission because um, based upon what we've just been talking about, about recovering the, the godness of God. Um, what what is the or the the book or the books that you have not written that you wish you had or or will? Well, the book I would like to write, which I'm not capable of writing, and I wouldn't say that in any sense of false modesty. I'm mm. not capable of doing it either intellectually or spiritually is the godness of God. Mm -hmm. Donald MacLeod, who died recently uh, in Scotland, wrote a book, Behold Your God. I, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, Donald was profoundly idiosyncratic, but profoundly rich and probably the best prose writer of theology I've ever actually read. Hmm. So why don't you think, why don't you feel that you are the man for the, the job? Because my knowledge of God is so poor. But, but we could all say that. We could, but I'm saying it. Hmm. I'm saying it though because I think I should. I know it to be true, I feel it to be true. I think people have a higher regard for me than they should. I think I give the impression I know more than I really do. <laughs> um, so, well, when you speak Latin in and out like you do. Well, <laughs> you see, yeah, um, <clears throat> I've just got a good memory. And um, mm. I, you know, I was saying to someone recently, I said, they said how, how can you remember these long quotes? I said, look, I've, I've read that page in Owen, I won't exaggerate, 200 times. Yeah. You, you can do the same thing in your carpentry shop. Yeah. It's, 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 it's no different. Yeah. Horses for courses. Mm. I have been privileged with a, a decent memory. 
for which I'm very thankful. Mm -hmm. um, after I, my first year teaching at Edinburgh Theological Seminary when I left Cambridge, uh, students now critique their professors. Glasgow University require this, they provide the degree. So the vice principal had me in and uh, he said, well, um, let, let, let me start with the positives because we've got two negatives. He said, the students really enjoy your teaching. So that, that was happening. I thought, well, that's okay. He said, um, but they have two complaints. And the first one is you expect them to read too much. Mm. Well, I said, I have a three word response, get a life. I, 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 I couldn't believe it. I would have bitten a professor's hand off if he said, no, here are however many books. I said, I just said, get up earlier and go to bed later. And the second one was, they said, you don't always translate the Latin. To which I replied, I always do. They don't always listen. <laughs> um, but Sinclair Ferguson gave me one bit of advice when I started teaching in Edinburgh. He said, education today is not what it was 40 years ago. Now, I knew that in my head. We, we were brought up in this roughly the same part of Glasgow, Mine was a little more down market, perhaps. We went to different schools. He's a few years ahead of me. Um, but it was a real wake-up call to me to find I was teaching young men who hadn't read classics. They hadn't read uh, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Milton, um, whatever, uh, Dickens or anything. That, that astonished me. But nor had they read... Not one person in the class of 21 had read anything by B.B. Warfield, John Murray, or John Owen. Mm. Now, maybe it was in the Lord's kindness as a young Christian I was exposed to this. I thought, I was younger than you and hardly converted, and I was reading John Murray and Warfield and Calvin. Um, but they read blogs. And they, they read some quite good modern books. I, I, I think some of them were, I've never read them, but I have a very limited repertoire. Um, but I thought, how are you going to sustain a ministry on that kind of reading? You're not, the next wave's going to come along and you're going to end up drifting with that wave. Mm -hmm. You need ballast. And they say, oh, well, you know, Owen's hard to read. And I said, well, it, that's overdone. Anyway, there are modern um, treatments of Owen that simplify. Uh, uh, yeah, the banner do it, and some of them are good. Yeah. I've been reading Owen on gospel ministry. Absolutely wonderful. Just stick it in your pocket and off you go. Um, but I think it was the preaching I was hearing and the praying I was hearing gave me such a sense of how great God is. I, I wanted to read people who believed that and who would help me enter more into the wonder of that. Hmm. Was that somewhat of what drew you to Calvin? Yeah, Calvin to me... Um, from the very outset, married together theology and piety. Mm -hmm. You know, in the introduction, uh, when he dedicates the preface to Francis I, he, he talks about pietas. He's writing it not just so that the Frenchman, for whom he's initially writing it, will have correct views. He, he wants them to be imbued with piety. And what, is, what profoundly influenced me later was discovering this. In 1543, Calvin was persuaded by Busser and a few others, Ed Bullinger, to write a defense of the Reformation called on the, the necessity of reforming the church. He dedicates it to the Emperor Charles V. And he says in the preface, uh, Your Majesty, if you are asking why there has been a reformation, there are two reasons. 
And the first would astonish most evangelicals. Number one, God is not being worshipped according to his word. And secondly, salvation is being hidden from the people. Mm. It's their... It's, it's their understanding of who God is, that the gospel is first about God and not about us. It is about us, but it's principally, foundationally, principially about God. God's ultimate purpose is the exaltation of his son in the light of the salvation of his people. And that's why they took worship so seriously. And that's gave birth to the regulative principle. Now, Calvin didn't use that phrase, but essentially that's what he's saying. So when he writes to Sadoleto in 1539, he says, there is nothing more perilous to our salvation than a preposterous view of worship. That would bewilder mm. evangelicals today. You know, mm. what's, what's worship got to do with salvation? Mm. And the reformers and the church in the centuries prior to that, would look at you with bewilderment. How can you even ask such a question? So, yeah, Calvin, I did my first degree dissertation on uh, economic history was the subject. And the senior honours class had to write a dissertation in their final year. And everyone's writing about transatlantic trade and the cotton industry. And I wrote on... <laughs> John Calvin and the struggle for reformed orthodoxy in Geneva with special attention to the doctrines of the church and predestination. <laughs> and my professor, I remember, looked at me and he was a really nice, he was a Roman Catholic. I got on very well with him. And he just went, okay. <laughs> um, so I loved it. And it was good preparation. I then went on to study theology in Edinburgh. So, um, so here you are studying economic history and yet obviously doing a lot of reading in Calvin yeah. leading up to the decision to make that your, your topic. Yeah, yeah. I first read a biography um, of Calvin, Emanuel Stickelberger, and then one by Jean Cadier, small biographies. And then my mother, who was a Roman Catholic, um, generously against her better judgment, bought me Calvin's commentaries on Luther mm. for my 21st birthday. Um, <laughs> she swallowed her Roman pride and let Luther into the house. Uh, she said, I don't want Martin Luther in this house. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she did. And uh, Calvin's been my, my go-to. Um, you know, he, he isn't a Puritan, so he, he writes beautifully. Mm -hmm. I, I have a friend who's a professor of French literature who told me that Calvin and Pascal are really the originators of modern French prose. Interesting. I've never heard that. Yeah. I've never um, heard Calvin mentioned in those, in yeah. those terms. Oh, he's a yeah, very, very fine. Yeah. It is interesting, isn't it, how these, these books that we read or are given to us have such a huge impact on the trajectory of our lives thereafter. I remember it was reading um, Dubigny, uh -huh. on the history of the Reformation in yeah. England. Yeah. And I'd somehow, a copy had just landed in my hands. I don't even remember how. And I was reading that at, 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 at the about the same time that I was deciding whether or not to go to seminary. So I finished the book just before, maybe the week or two before I started seminary. And I knew, I was like, I'm going to go to England and study someday. <laughs> Because I here here you are reading about Latimer, Ridley, you know, uh, Wycliffe. These men who mm -hmm. were in the in the furnace. Yeah. Well, actually, they were part of that. Uh, what was it called? The German cohort. There, in, you uh, you served in Cambridge for years, so you would know this. Yeah, the German colony. Yeah, in the White Horse Inn. Yeah. Yeah, I used to walk past where the White Horse Inn was most days uh, to meet students, go to the university library. and. So for those listening who aren't familiar, the, who was the German colony and why were they called that? Well, when Erasmus published uh, the Greek New Testament for the first time in 1516, I mean, it had 
it, in one sense, it was more profoundly significant than Luther's 95 Theses the following year. The 95 Theses, they're very interesting, and of course they gave birth to a kind of resurgent German nationalism and anti-papalism, but there's really nothing gospel. The 97 Theses that he wrote three weeks earlier are far more Augustinian and very interesting. The 97 are really, really very good. So after 1516, um, copies of the Greek New Testament find their way to England, and then you've got Luther's tracts, 1523 tracts begin to appear. And scholars begin to meet, and you've got two universities in England. Uh, actually, at one time, Scotland had five, when England only had two. <laughs> um, and they're beginning to meet, and, and they're reading Luther's tracts, Liberty of the Christian Man, and they're reading the New Testament in Greek. And and they're comparing it to the Vulgate. Mm. And they're thinking, oh, Jesus doesn't say, go and do penance. He says, repent, you know, metanoia, metanoia. And justification, dikaiosune, doesn't mean to make righteous, it mm. means to declare righteous. So this group of scholars began to meet in the White Horse Inn, a uh, little colony of Ger Little Germany, they called it. Um, that was a disparaging term, though, right? Yes, because Luther wasn't yet prescribed uh, papally till really 1521. Uh, and even then, um, you could still uh, read... Uh, Luther's work smuggled in and, you know, your life wasn't in danger. You might be, you know, disciplined in some form, but it's not until later in the 1520s that really um, the church thinks, oh goodness, we need to do something. Now Luther writes The Bondage of the Will and mm -hmm. um, Henry writes his Septem Sacramentorum, the seven sacraments defending the church against Luther. Um, and so later on in late 1520s, Thomas Bilney and others, they are eventually executed, burned at the stake yeah. because they are holding fast to the doctrines of the gospel. And little Germany um, lingers uh, underground um, and becomes resurgent again uh, 1547 when Edward the boy king comes to the throne and then Bloody Mary six years later she mm -hmm. replaces him and everything's in turmoil and Elizabeth comes 1558 and um, Protestants can somewhat relax um, unless you're a Presbyterian and you want something better than a via media so Thomas Cartwright <laughs> and Walter Travers um, they become, you know, the bête noire of Elizabeth because they say, you know, we must have a polity that's faithful to the word and not simply accommodating the monarch. Mm. Mm. So. What a history. Was it, as someone like yourself who has been such a student of history your whole life, were you aware of that serving in Cambridge in this given the history of Cambridge and the history of the Reformation, like God put you there. And knowing that you had this strong uh, proclivity to this type of, this type of history, yeah. this legacy. One of the things that saddened me was um, how little, even the students who came to Cambridge, mm how ignorant they were of their history. Yeah. The, good, the good Christian students, we, we, we had just some outstanding students. They, they weren't wanting me to be profound. They wanted me to preach the word. Mm -hmm. And, but when I would speak to them about, um, you know, the, the history of, of Cambridge, uh, going back to the early 16th century, almost every one of them knew nothing. Hmm. Um, it's as if almost in, in schools uh, that 
the the spiritual nature of history, which really was at the very heart of everything, had been excised, and everything was political. Um, so I was greatly privileged to have many opportunities. The Christian Union InterVarsity in Cambridge University is very strong. And they were very kind to me. They, they invited me many, many times. I think as someone once said, we, we, we do like you coming, Mr. Hamilton. You're a little different. <laughs> you know, I wasn't Oxbridge trained. I didn't go to a public school. I didn't have the accent. Um, but I think it was, I, 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 pre, I think, I hope to preach theologically. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the folk found that, that's very interesting. You know, you, you, you say things we don't hear. And I'm thinking, well, that's sad. I'm not yeah. saying anything new. Yeah. Um, but being able to, you know, give lectures we, we support. We, we started the Cambridge Historical Lecture, which mm -hmm. we held in the Round Church, very famous church in Cambridge, who do an excellent work of doing walking tours of Cambridge, um, taking people through the history, and they're, they're very fine Christians, and they're able to bring the gospel to these walking tours. Um, and we, we started the Cambridge Lecture, and we had people giving lectures on uh, Thomas Bilney or um, the Marian Martyrs or, or whoever, um, uh, Luther, uh, Knox, Calvin. Mm. Um, they, they weren't very well attended, uh, but I loved them. I, I, I invited friends of mine to give them. My wife would have gone. Good for her. She, uh, she, oh, she loved going to Cambridge. We were in Durham for five, six years, and then London for three. And we, we went up to Cambridge as much as we could. I, I would go there often just for things, um, maybe at Tyndall House or mm -hmm. had some friends there. But um, yeah, she, some of our students would study at Tyndale. Yeah. Yeah. Which was an interesting experience for them. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of the fact that your wife is here with you. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm happy to wrap this up, but I did want to end on uh, one question, bringing us back to the opening question I gave you. And that is being cognizant of the fact that there will be uh, probably many thousands of um, current and maybe soon to be ministers listening to this. What would you tell them at the as they begin their their ministry, or maybe they're in the middle of it? But what would you tell them about um, making God big? The about you know from from the very from the very minute they hear this of like of thinking, I need to go home and think more about the godness of God and how vocationally, it's, it's my job to deliver that to my people. Well, how could, what are some practically, I know you've talked about contemplation, perhaps they need, we all need to spend more time just contemplating God, but mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's going to be many people who listen to this thinking like, I want that. I want to think that I want to do that. Read the first three volumes of John Owen. Volume two first, then volume volume two on communion with God, volume one, the glory of Christ, volume three on the Holy Spirit. Nothing will more prime your mind and heart. Someone once asked me in Cambridge, one of our brilliant students, she's uh, she, she was a wonderful girl, studied at Yale and has a uh, teaching now at Duke, lovely mm. Christian girl, married mm. one of our elders. She said, what is it you like so much about John Owen? You know, I, I don't know Owen remotely as, as Sinclair does. I said, well, he takes me into an atmosphere that's not of this world. Mm. When I first read volume two of Owen, I hope I don't say this for effect. At times I just was 
weeping. Um, I can still, you know, can still quote bits of it um, that just stunned me. Um, mm. Every day while he lives is Christ's wedding day. He rejoices over his people with delight. Well, that's Zephaniah 3. Um, Owen, uh, I, I think Sinclair put it well um, years ago. I think it must have been the podcast. I didn't see the podcast. Someone asked him about, you know, he's had a profound influence on so many. He said, what, 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 what made you what you are? And he said, well, Calvin shaped me and Owen filled me. Hmm. And I knew immediately what he meant. Um, I think there are, there are things that can prime you. Uh, Owen does that for me. John Murray, who, <laughs> who's not, you know, he, he, he doesn't write remotely as Calvin or Donald MacLeod or Sinclair. John Murray is just wonderful. Uh, you know, he uses words like protasis and apodesis, and uh, you think, well, what? What on earth is that? Mm -hmm. But redemption accomplished and applied. If, forget the first chapter. Go back to that at the end, although the first chapter is wonderful. Consequent absolute necessity and absolute necessity. When I first read John Murray, I've got the date, still got the original copy. I've used other copies. Still got the date and what I paid for it. I never knew the gospel was as profound. And uh, if I had any one little book to take on a desert island apart from God's word, it would be John Murray's Redemption Accomplished and Applied. So, you know, find, find books. Um, read Augustine's Confessions. That is just, you know, a stunning read. Uh, you, you kind of, it's unput downable almost. Um, uh, and then there, you know, there are there are modern books that um, you know. When when I read Ian Murray, I don't think anyone writes biography like Ian Murray, whether it's Jonathan Edwards um, or Pentecost Today, which Paul Washer loves, um, or Revival and Revivalism. It's inspirational in the best sense. It's he's holding up the greatness of God. And these are the kind of books that um, just stir your soul and sweep away the cobwebs. And as I said with Owen, they you know, take you into the clearer air of an atmosphere where um, you, you're, you're being confronted with, with Bible truths that you may know, but it's as if you're being taken on an exploration into their immensities and infinities. Mm. So read classics. Read. Work hard at own. Don't be put off by mm. the Latinate sentences. You know, probably he found it easier to write in Latin and speak in Latin almost than English. But persevere and if you find that just too much then get these modernized versions of own uh, the banner do quite a few mm -hmm. and the one on gospel ministry um which is a compilation of sermons from volume 9 and volume 14 um it's just great i've got it at my bedside and uh, occasionally I'll, I'll stop and i'll write a little article on on a paragraph he's written, or a sentence he's written, or a word. Uh, it's just the way I, I, I help my, mm -hmm. I get help by writing out my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I throw them away, but explicating what I think is being said. Hugh Martin, oh my, could we could go on and on. Not the easiest read, his little book on the atonement. Um, probably as a difficult read for even divinity students. But my, oh my. Yeah, I've said enough. The way you talk about these books, this thought just came to me, but I realize 
I myself have fallen in, into this trap of thinking of books in terms of their content rather than the, the man behind the pen. And so the way that you've spoken about Calvin, um, about Owen, about others, it's as you've been talking about them, I'm sitting here thinking about, oh, that's right. There was a man behind those words mm -hmm. who wasn't just trying to convey information about God, but that man had this relationship with God that he was trying to express in some way through the writing. And, and, and as a reader, you're being invited into, uh, to look inside that man's soul, their, their, their brain, their soul, their heart, everything that constitutes who they are as a man united with Christ. And that puts a, just sitting here thinking about it, I, it's like, um, yeah, I really do want to read more of Owen. Why? Because I want to know Owen and by knowing Owen better, I'll know God better. Does that make sense? It, it does. I, I just was thinking, you know, Calvin had a motto, my heart, I give to you, O God, promptly and sincerely. And I think that's Calvin's theological writings. Mm. It's, it's my heart, I give to you. You know, Calvin had his blemishes and he was very conscious of them and it grieved him deeply. He could blow up at times. But people loved him who knew him because his theology laid bare his heart. Um, you know, he, he was a, a, a kind of tightly buttoned up Frenchman. You know, he wasn't an effusive man. He, he was reserved uh, when, you know, when Idolette de Boer died and her child died, people criticized Calvin, what they perceived to be a certain coldness. It's nothing of the sort. He was deeply, deeply grieved. But when he writes, there's a pulse beat um, in his writings, and it's the pulse beat of life. Um, it's not just um, brute chunks of fact, good fact, reformed fact, orthodox fact. Hmm. Um, I remember Eric Alexander, who, who, who died, earlier this year, I had the privilege of taking his funeral. He once said, he said, you know, Ian, you have to be exceedingly gifted to make God dull. Sadly, many ministers are very gifted. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, and he really was saying, you know, it's almost impossible to make God seem dull. You, you have to be gifted to do that because God is the richness of life in its fullness. And that somehow needs to be communicated. Initially, that's why the, that, that's why the opening praise and the opening prayer of a service of worship cast a shadow over everything. Um, and it's those opening prayers of those men I mentioned earlier that actually so deeply affected me and almost whetted my appetite. I couldn't wait for the preaching of the word because mm -hmm. I knew I was going to get more of the same. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that you do write the godness of God. I really do. Well, but uh, I, not to pressure you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for this. This has been um, an honor and a privilege for me. I know many other people will benefit from it. You've made me miss England very much. Maybe even Scotland. <laughs> And Scotland, we would. Well, I was at Durham, so we would drive up there on occasion. And my uh, Good for you. 
my second cousin is in Glasgow still. Oh, right. My home city. Yeah. Yep. An expat over there. So we miss it. But anyway, thank you very much. It's been it's a been great really pleasure, pleasure. Travis. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thanks, my, Ian. My privilege. Thank, thank you. you.